I've been thinking about what to uh, share this morning, the first Sabbath in 2020. And it seems to me that, um, speaking for myself, there's a lot of a lot of pain and suffering that I see around me. I see in my own life in a few small ways, but some relatives, church members, church families. It's a lot of um, a lot of persecution in some parts of the world. There's um, especially after the holidays, there tends to be a feeling of, I guess depression would be the best word to put on it because you kind of feel let down after all the family's been there, the excitement and everything. And um, So I was wondering what to speak about. I've really enjoyed the class on Hebrews and there's one chapter specifically that I think speaks to to that situation that I see myself facing, that in some ways I see our church facing as well. You know, burnout is a real thing. It affects Christians. And the Bible has answers for that. Um, so with that, let me tell you a story. Well, um, no, let me tell you half of a story. And then the last half, of course, comes later. Micah Herndon was a 31-year-old Marine veteran from Talmadge, Ohio, and he was running to honor three fallen friends, fellow Marines Mark Juarez and Matthew Ballard, and a British journalist named Rupert Hammer. All three were killed when their vehicle hit an IED in Afghanistan in 2010. Herndon was in the same convoy at the time. He, in fact, was the lead machine gunner. And you know, survivor guilt's a real thing. He would always be haunted with the thought, maybe if I'd been more attentive, if I'd seen some sign of that IED, my friends would still be here with me. So he started running to help deal with this guilt that he was experiencing, the uh, negative emotions and the, the depression. The Boston Marathon, which is what he was running in currently, was his third marathon. His goal was to finish in two hours and 53 minutes. He had finished the Akron Marathon, the one he had just uh, run several uh, months prior, in two hours, 55 minutes. But, and I don't, I'm not a runner, don't know anything about this, apparently in the Boston Marathon around mile 20, there's this thing called Heartbreak Hill. And it's just what, you, what it sounds like. It took its toll, and by mile 22, his legs didn't really work for running very well. That's when I realized I wouldn't get my goal time, Herndon said. I felt like a failure, like I failed my brothers who I had lost. I still had 4.2 miles to go, and I could hardly keep a power walk pace. But Herndon was still on a mission for his brothers, <clears throat> so he vowed to finish by any means necessary without aid. His legs held up and he, until he turned onto Boylston Street. He made it most of the way down with the finish line clock in sight, but about 75 yards from the finish line, he stopped. And our story stops. We're going to study a race today uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. But before we do, let's pray. Dear Jesus, I ask that your word will speak to each one of us today. Man's words, if they have any value, echo the words of God. I ask that um, through the power of the Holy Spirit, each of us will understand something new from the Bible today that will touch our lives and give us a um, new understanding of what it means to run the race. In Jesus' name, amen. I really enjoyed Sabbath school this morning. Had a lot of good participation. So we'll have a little bit of participation here as well. I have a microphone. 
And to save my voice, I'm going to, various points in the service, ask uh, individuals to read. So go to Hebrews chapter 12, and you better be there because I might call on you. So everyone there, if you're there, say amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 12. It's good to see you here, sir. Can you read for us? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So if I had to ask you about this race, would you say it's more like a 50-yard dash or more like an Ironman sort of? It's definitely the Ironman. Why would you say it's more like the Ironman based on the verse there? Because as we read it, it's the word endurance, you have to continue. To endure something is to go through something that, you know, really takes a lot out of you. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. Um, question in general for the congregation. Do each one of us have a race to run? Yes. We do. Do you get to choose your race? What does it say in the verse? It's the race that's set before you. Who sets it before you? God does. Let's hear, say that louder. God. That's exactly right. God's the one who gets to choose. We don't get to choose. Who's this cloud of witnesses that's being referred to? Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, of course, is the chapter we call the? The faith chapter. And there are people who have gone before us. Um, certainly the heroes of faith mentioned here, but um, each of us in our own lives probably have individuals that have gone before us as well, don't we? That have showed us the way, that have inspired faith in us. The last part of the verse has three commands. Do you see them? What's the first command? Say again. Say it louder. Lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. And then there's something else we're to lay aside as well, right? The sins. Are those things different sometimes? They are. Um, question for the kids. Justin, have you ever run a race? Yeah. You have? Did you win? No. You didn't close. win. Close. close, close. Okay. Do you think you would have done better or worse if you'd gotten a whole bunch of rocks and put them in your pockets? Um, a little bit worse. A little bit worse? Wow, he's a strong boy. He doesn't care if he has rocks in his pockets. So you fill up all your rocks with, all your pockets with rocks, and you're weighed down. And you're going to do a little bit worse. Now, is it wrong to run with rocks in your pockets? No. No. Is there any command in the Bible that says you can't do that? No. It's not wrong to do that. But if you're running a race, you don't want to do that. If you want to win, right? If you want to endure to the end, as Kip said. But there are certainly sins also that we need to lay aside, aren't there? I'm speaking to you kind of from my heart here. It seems to me that for myself, it's very frequent that the weights lead to sins. Does that make sense to you what I'm talking about? That if we understand that we're running a race, and that there are certain things that we need to lay aside as part of that process, that if we choose to hold on to those things anyway, that's going the wrong direction, isn't it? That indicates kind of an attitude that, you know, what's wrong with this anyway? That type of attitude, at least in my life, invariably leads me into sin. Even if the thing that... I'm wanting to hold on to that I recognize as a weight as I choose to hold on to it it leads me downhill and then what's the last command in that verse let us run with patience or endurance depending on your Bible translation probably endurance is a better translation uh, for us today but uh, we'll see the same word all through Hebrews chapter 12 and we're going to go over specifically what this patience and endurance is. It's a huge point in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go on now to verse 2 
Linda, I see your Bible open. Could you read for me verse 2? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. So you were in the Hebrews class, Linda, so I'm going to ask you a really hard question based on this verse. Who is our example? Our example is Jesus. Okay, good. I'm <laughs> glad that uh, you can keep the mic. I've got some more harder questions for you here. Um, Jesus does two things in this verse, right? What are the things that he does? He endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, he did all those things too. Back up to the beginning of the verse though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a read my mind question and Linda and I haven't perfected our mind reading yet. <laughs> As pertains to our faith, Jesus does two things. Mm -hmm. He endured the cross. No, as pertains to our faith. To our faith. All the way back at the beginning of the verse. Uh, verse 2. Uh, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, Looking the... Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher. Yeah, so he's the one. Does any of your Bibles say the beginner or the progenitor or something like that? Pioneer. The pioneer is the idea. The idea of the author, it doesn't necessarily mean writing something. It means the one who begins it, the one who starts it. But also he's the, the one who completes it, the, the finisher. finisher. And that work is exactly the same word that is the last word in Hebrews chapter 11 should not be made perfect. perfect. Jesus is the one who perfects or brings to completion our faith. He begins it and he's the one who finishes it. I like the word author though because in the book of Hebrews, when you begin your Christian walk, is there some writing that happens on you? Do you remember Hebrews chapter, I think it's chapter 10? When you begin your Christian walk, God does some writing on you. Do you remember what he writes and where he writes it? He writes his law in our hearts. We might come back to that idea. The idea that Jesus is the author, the beginner. He's the one who writes on us. But he's also the one who finishes. The rest of this verse that Linda was uh, referring to talks about two events in the life of Christ. One is linked with beginning our faith. See, as we look to Jesus on the cross, that's what begins our faith. It's the foundation of the Christian hope. But as we understand what Jesus is doing, sat at the right hand of the throne of God, that's Jesus' ministry in heaven. And it is that ministry that we especially want to understand today because that is what finishes the work in us. Both of these phases are seen all through the book of Hebrews, and they're both very, very important. We're going to come back to these two concepts because they're what I want for 2020 and they're what I want for our church family. The idea of endurance or patience and the idea of faith. Faith and patience are linked in the scriptures many times and we're going to come back to those. Along those lines though, look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3 and 4. Let's see. Danique, can I pick on you here? Read for me verse 3 and verse 4. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. Thank you. I think that these verses have a secret for us. What was it Jesus did? Again, that same word. He endured. What was it he endured in this verse? Hostility or contradiction of sinners against himself. I like the old King James. It's just so poetic. Contradiction of sinners against himself. Um, I need to use that verse with my children sometime. I promised them I wouldn't tell about um, squawking in our home, but um, that's our new favorite word at our house. Um, and contradiction of sinners against yourself seems like a pretty good definition for squawking. But uh, we need to learn to endure things that come to us, don't we? In Jesus' case, not only did he endure contradiction against himself, but in verse 2, what did he endure? He endured the cross. So the race set before Jesus included persecution from others and eventually death on a cross. And somehow, as we learn to look to Jesus 
and consider him, it helps with our endurance. Do you see that in those verses? We need to learn to consider Jesus. Have you perhaps heard that we need to spend a thoughtful hour every day considering Jesus? You heard this? Are you familiar with this idea? So in 2020, if you are feeling depressed, if you're feeling burned out, if you're feeling like perhaps life is just coming at you from all angles, we need to learn again. I need to learn again. I need to learn for perhaps the first time. What does it mean to consider him? Because it is that that is going to help with my endurance. I'm not going to ask you to read verse 5 through 11, but I'm going to ask all of you to scan over that section, and there's a key word that I want you to see there. The question is, what is it you're called to endure specifically in verses 5 through 11? Oh, say it out. Chastening. Chastening. Now, if I ask Justin if what chastening means, would he know? He's shaking his head no. That's a pretty big word, isn't it? Let's ask, um, let's see. I don't know. Who am I going to ask to explain what chastening is here? I don't know. Emily, you were in the uh, Hebrews class as well. What does the word chastening mean to you? Correction. Um, working on certain aspects of one's character. <laughs> okay, correction. Is that a good synonym? I like that. Justin, you know what correction is? You know what correction is. What are some other words? Discipline. Spanking. Reynolds, thank you. Is that chastening? It sure is. Justin, do you know what spanking is? Uh, never mind. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> Justin's never going to sit here ever again. Chastening. We need to endure chastening. Do you see that over and over again in those verses, 5 through 11? We're not going to study every single verse in Hebrews 12, I promise. But I want you to see that this section is of special interest to us today. It specifically applies to each one of us in God's church at this time in earth's history. Why? Do you remember at the end of time, the last of the seven churches is called the church of? What does the church of Laodicea get from God? Chastening. Look at Revelation 3, verse 19. Keep a finger here. Look at Revelation 3, verse 19. This is to the last church. God's people at the end of time are a sorry mess, if you've ever studied the church of Laodicea. But God doesn't want to leave them there, so what does he give them? Revelation 3, 19. Who's there? All right. Could you pass this down for me? Thanks. I'll walk around there. Read for me Revelation 3, verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and chasten, so be zealous and repent. Thank you. So keep the mic. In that verse, it tells us why Jesus reproves us or chastens us. Why does he do that to us? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Did you see that back in Hebrews chapter 12 as well? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, what does it say? Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Thank you. So that gives us the reason, the emotion, or the impetus for Christ to reprove us and to chasten us. And that's what he's doing specifically for our church right now. But what's God's purpose or goal in reproving and chastening his church? Go back to Hebrews chapter 12. God's church needs it. And if you look through here, verse 11, verse 10, why is it that God is chastening his church? To bring righteousness. And there's a synonym for righteousness in the other verse. To bring holiness. God's church at the end of time needs chastening. And Jesus will do this because he loves them. He has a goal in mind. The goal is, uh, the goal of chastening is to bring righteousness and to bring holiness. Do you see that in those verses? So Justin, when your parents spank you, what is it they're trying to do? 
They're trying to discipline you so you can be righteous and holy. And um, that same goes for my kids down the road there a little farther as well. Um, I love embarrassing my kids. Jesus wants to chasten us. And Hebrews chapter 12 is a race that we are on. And Jesus, along the way, needs to teach us lessons. I want you to see some connections here. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 through 14. Let's come over here. I haven't been over here much. Daniel, can you read that for me? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 through 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. 12 12 verse 14? 14. Uh, 12 12 through 14. All three verses there, yeah. Therefore, strengthen the hands which, which hand down and the feeble knees. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dis- dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Okay, thank you. Have you ever felt that way, Daniel? Hanging down, discouraged, tired. What about you? You seem a little more cheerful than myself or some others here, perhaps. You were smiling more when I asked, uh, yeah, like Anthony over there. Anthony's smiling. But when I looked out of the congregation today, I don't know. It seemed to me there was like a weight on some of you. Maybe there's some weights we need to get rid of. I don't know. That's a different application. But it is possible in the Christian life that some people like my wife are halfway up Mount Whitney and their feet are about to be lame. They're trying to put one foot in front of the other, but they're not going to make it. What does this verse tell us to do? Help them. Help them. Make straight paths for your feet. Verse 13, do you see that we're talking about a pathway? We're still talking about that same journey, just like in verse 1. And verse 14, the first word is follow. Of course, we're following Jesus, and Jesus wanted peace with all men. We're talking in chapter 12 about a race, a journey, a path, some place that we are to follow. And along the way, Jesus is going to teach us lessons. I want you to see that chapter 12 in Hebrews is a manual on how Laodicean Christians become part of the 144,000. This is the pathway. This is the race that is set before us to go from a people who need chastening to a people that exemplify holiness and righteousness because they've accepted the chastening. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Who are we following again? Who's our example? Jesus. What does it say about the 144,000 in Revelation 14, verse 5? They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They're following in that pathway. We're going to talk here about patience and faith. You might recall that Revelation 13, 10 and 14, 12 say here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. If we follow the path outlined here in Hebrews chapter 12, skipping down some verses to verse 22, where is it we end up? We are coming to Mount Zion. Where are the 144,000 pictured in Revelation 14 verse 1? They're on Mount Zion. This pathway is to take us there. In light of the message that we understand, the three angels' messages, we need to serve God in Hebrews 12, 28 down near the end of the chapter, with reverence and godly godly fear. You might remember that our message, our end-time message to give to the world in Revelation 14, 7, calls everyone to fear God. Why fear God? Well, Revelation, I'm sorry, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12 gives one answer. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29. Why is it weird to fear God? Our God is a consuming fire. Does Revelation talk about God being a consuming fire? It sure does. And um, we don't want to be on one side of that consuming. But you might remember Isaiah 33 talks about how those who are righteous are going to dwell in the midst of that consuming fire. It depends on how we respond to the the chastening that God sends us. So to summarize, Hebrews chapter 12 is a description of a path for us 
today. It's a description of a path that will help Laodiceans become part of the 144,000. It's a description of a path that takes those who need chastisement to those who make it to Mount Zion. And there are two basic components, faith and patience. Let's talk about faith, first of all. Is faith an important concept? Sure it is. We talk about justification by? Righteousness by? We talk about the faith of Jesus, the faith once delivered to the saints. Faith is very important. I'm not going to go through the entire Bible and spend a lot of time on faith. I'm going to take a shortcut this morning to help us understand what faith is. You might remember there's a text in Habakkuk chapter 2 that Paul quotes three times in Romans 1, Galatians 3, and Hebrews 10. We studied in Hebrews 10. And that, of course, has to do with faith. The just shall live by faith. Famous passage. You remember Martin Luther was going up the staircase on his knees and all of a sudden into his mind flashed that passage. The just shall live by faith. But Jesus also told us how to live, also quoting the Old Testament. He was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 when Jesus told Satan, man shall not live by bread alone. But how is man to live? Man's to live by Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So either there are two different ways that we are to live, or these two things are describing exactly the same thing. I'm sure it's that second, that these two passages are describing exactly the same thing. If you want a longer study of that, there's an excellent book called Lessons on Faith by Jones and Wagner that gives a much longer study. But faith is living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And when I understood that, all of a sudden, parts of the Christian walk that were a little bit mysterious to me kind of came alive. Parts of the Christian walk that, you know, the idea of faith and works, you know, how do those work together? Well, consider this. If you're reading the Bible and you read a promise in Scripture, like I'm going to take your sins and plunge them to the depths of the sea. I'm going to blot out your sins um, or I will come again and receive you to myself. When you read a promise in the Bible, faith is living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and that faith grasps that promise and it looks an awful lot like confidence and assurance, trust. But what if faith reads a command in Scripture? What if faith reads a command in Scripture? Living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, when I read a command in Scripture, faith looks exactly like obedience. That is living by faith. Faith is living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Faith is trusting in God, believing that He loves us and knows what is for our best good. Thus, instead of our own way, it leads us to choose His way. In place of our ignorance, it accepts his wisdom. In place of our weakness, his strength. In place of our sinfulness, his righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already his. Faith acknowledges his ownership and accepts its blessing. Where there is not only a belief in God's word, but also a submission of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him, the affections fixed upon him, there is faith. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. I need more faith. I need to understand how to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So that's faith. But we also need endurance or patience. I think it's easier to understand patience or endurance when we're living by faith. And I already told you I think a better word is endurance. Look back at Hebrews 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. In verse 1, we are to have endurance In verse 2 and 3, we're considering Jesus and his example of endurance and how he endured the race set before him. Considering Jesus will prevent weariness and fainting in our race. For sake of time, I'll just refer you to Galatians 6 verse 9. Let us not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Have you ever felt like fainting? I have. 
And I think a lot of us feel like fainting. But friends, here is the antidote to burnout. Faith and patience, endurance. It seems that this patient endurance is a key concept in the Christian walk. We've already seen in Revelation 13 and 14 that patience or endurance is a key characteristic of God's people at the end of time. Why is that? Well, there's a few obvious answers, but I'd like to suggest one that perhaps is not as obvious. Turn with me in your Bibles a few pages over, maybe just one page over, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 2 through 4. Let's see. Who am I going to pick on now? Rosie, you smiled at me. So read for me James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Thank you. Do you all see in this verse a connection to Hebrews chapter 12 and how Jesus lived? Remember Jesus in verse 2, it said, For the joy set before him. And here in James chapter 1, we're talking about counting things all joy. What is it we're supposed to count all joy in verse 2? Trials, temptations, problems, bad things that happen to us. We wouldn't normally count those things as good, would we? Why is it we can count them as good? It's because we understand something, right? What is it we understand in verse 3 and 4? What is it that we know? We know that the trying of our faith works patience. Do you see those two together again? There's faith and patience here, and the trials of our faith help us develop patience. Is developing patience important? To be part of God's end time people, it's necessary. And verse 4 explains why it's necessary. Look at verse 4 again. It's almost a passive process. Do you see that? Let patience work on you. Let patience have her perfect work in your life so that you can be perfect and entire wanting nothing. It says the same thing three times in a row. Like Hebrews chapter 12 said, righteous or holy. Patience wants to work on you and you need to let it do its work in your life. See, there's going to be trials that come to each one of us. We're going to have those feelings of burnout. We're going to have negative life experiences. Think right now of my mother's cousin who's a pastor, a godly man in um, California and he lost his first wife to cancer. She was a wonderful woman. And God provided a, another spouse for him who's been just a godly pastor's wife and raised their three children. Wonderful woman. And, and then she um, recently had an accident and has a massive neurologic injury. And today, they're weaning the uh, coma to see how much brain function she has left. You know, I can't even imagine what their family's going through. But these life circumstances come to each one of us. I just heard a few moments ago about one of our friends from Eastridge Church just received a cancer diagnosis at age 21, 18. Um, one of my good friends in California just received a cancer diagnosis probably about a month ago at age 39. How are we to react to these negative circumstances? What about looking to Jesus? Yes. But what is it about these that we can count all joy? It's a difficult thing to say. It's an even more difficult thing to put into practice. But our response to these tryings of our faith develop patience. And that patience is the mechanism whereby Jesus is preparing each one of us for heaven. That's what James chapter 1 
his teaching. I want to read you a quote from the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. And I think that if we each learn to internalize this, it is what leads to joy, it's what led to joy in Christ's life, and it's what will lead to joy in my life today. It's a life-changing concept to realize it. The Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him, Jesus, but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his, Jesus, source of comfort, and it is for us. We can have the same source of comfort that Jesus had. Now personalizing it. He who is imbued with the spirit of Christ abides in Christ. So I have a mental image. Jesus knew that the Father surrounded him with his presence at all times. The only things that came to him came from God. You and I can have that same experience. We can be abiding in Christ, encircled by Christ. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission, and all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. So Michael Herndon, 31-year-old veteran, was running the Boston Marathon, and he was about 75 yards from the finish line when he stopped. He said about the experience, I couldn't lift my legs up anymore. They just couldn't move forward. I wasn't just going to sit there and let people carry me and quit. Not through the toughest times of that race did quitting enter my mind. I started the race by myself. I was going to finish it by myself. Unable to walk, Herndon began crawling, telling runners and medical staff not to help him until he was across the line. Multiple videos demonstrate the cloud of witnesses that cheered him on, but he didn't hear them. Tunnel vision and single-minded focus on the goal shut out everything else. When he crossed the finish line, the crowd erupted in cheers. One of the um, internet memes that's been made out of that story um, has the question, how badly do you want to finish? Right? So in the race set before you, how badly do you want to finish? We need faith to understand the nature of the race in which we're engaged. Because we're not engaged in a race competing against others. In fact, we're not really competing against anything except our own sinful selves. The race set before us is designed by God to develop in us a character fit for heaven. That is the race set before us. And as we understand that all things come from Christ, we will develop patience. We'll develop endurance. We'll develop a joy in the journey that is not comprehended or comprehensible to those around us who don't understand the experience of abiding in Christ.